Okay. I might just uh, add a couple of things on a personal note. I mentioned about how President Johnson really um, uh, uh, just made you feel like a million dollars with your family. Uh, my parents uh, from Muskogee, Oklahoma were visiting one time and and they came to a signing ceremony in the in the cabinet room um, and uh, President Johnson singled them out and brought them over and really uh, made them as proud parents I guess to say what I was doing at the White House etc and uh, uh, I, I didn't really recognize that at, at that age but now I, I do uh, having children of our own but my parents went back to um, back to Muskogee, Oklahoma to show you uh, a father's perspective. I, I, I would get to the White House about 7 to 7.30 at, at the latest in the morning to go to the president's bedroom and go over the daily activities and I never left until about 11, sometimes midnight at night when the president went to bed. And this occurred the whole time my parents were visiting me. So my dad goes back to uh, Muskogee and tells all about the trip and tells about how President Johnson uh, uh, so featured them at this signing ceremony in the cabinet room and talked about his son. He said, you know, my son really works hard. He said he goes to the White House every morning about 6.30, 7 o'clock, and he's, uh, he stays there till 11 o'clock, midnight. He said, you know what? The president stays with him the whole time. <laughs> it's a, a parent's perspective, which now I understand that I didn't at the time. I was embarrassed by it. Um, Bob, you had asked me about uh, the relationship with Lady Bird. Uh, it, was a very, it was a very interesting relationship. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, I think, relied on Lady Bird's uh, judgment more than anybody else. Her instinctive judgment about people, about uh, about things in general. And I know when we would give a major speech or if we were uh, going to the Manila Conference on Vietnam or various things like that, uh, the final person that he wanted to, to bounce off an idea or to bounce off uh, the, the speech would be Lady Bird. And uh, she was an amazing woman, is an amazing woman in that she, she just had an instinctive understanding about how to phrase something, how to connect with people, how to assess people, and, uh, and he really trusted that judgment. And it, it was a love affair. It was a complicated love affair, but it was a love affair and a, and a partnership that really, uh, that really worked. Um, other things, you know, there were so many, uh, I'm telling funny stories, or at least to me were funny, stories about Lyndon Johnson uh, because I think th this was the side of a Lyndon Johnson that that uh, the public didn't know that only these tapes being released are giving some idea of what Lyndon Johnson was like or the many Lyndon Johnsons were like. Um, he was very spontaneous. Uh, in 1967 I think it was we, uh, we had a, a Central American summit in uh, El Salvador and we stayed at our ambassador's residence uh, in, in San Salvador. Um, and our ambassador was a fellow named Raul uh, uh, Castro from Arizona. And uh, President Johnson was, had named him as ambassador to El Salvador and was about to, or was reappointing him as ambassador to uh, Bolivia. And so we stayed there. And among the people we found there was a Chinese houseboy whose family was still in the PRC and uh, and uh, so somewhere in these conversations uh, Ambassador Castro said that um, that this uh, this Chinese houseboy was really terrific and uh, that uh, that uh, somehow President Johnson ought to take him back to the United States and um, uh, because he can't he was not going to go to Bolivia with Ambassador Castro I didn't know about this conversation. And so the first morning of the summit, the president of El Salvador calls on the ambassador's residence and the, the two presidents in the back seats and me in the jump seat and go down to the, the convention. And so the president of El Salvador had some kind of a foreign aid grant request to, uh, for a few million dollars to build something in El Salvador. So he wanted to take advantage of that time to kind of lobby President Johnson to get that request uh, granted. 
So as every time he get to the 10 million or however much it was, a point uh, President Johnson interrupted him and would tell me, uh, uh, Jim, uh, we, got the, we got the Chinaman, uh, going to take him back with us on the plane? Well, I had no idea what he was talking about. And I said, of course, Mr. President, we'll take care of that. Everything's going to be fine. Well, the conversation would go back to this aid grant and get to that $10 million request. And again, he'd say, now be sure the Chinaman's on the plane with us. I said, yes, Mr. President, uh, we'll, we'll have him there. Well, I didn't think anything more about it. The conference, uh, the summit goes forward. And at the end of the summit, President Johnson says to magnanimously to all the presidents of Central America, he says, why don't you fellows ride back with me on Air Force One and we'll drop you off at each of your countries. Well, they all accepted. Well, this was totally unplanned and so we had to scramble to get Secret Service people and advance people to all of these uh, other five countries and to plan a little ceremony at each of these countries. So that was done in very short order. Uh, we go after all the closing and everything, we go uh, back to the residence and then to the Air Force One. And all the presidents are there in the back in the president's, uh, President Johnson's quarters on Air Force One. And I come in <clears throat> and he leans over to me and he said, where's my Chinaman? I said, Mr. President, I'm not sure, I don't know what you're talking And he erupts and he says, oh, that. I said, oh, that Chinaman. <laughs> and th these were days when that was not politically, uh, more political correctness in terms were not, uh, uh, I'm quoting now. I said, oh, that one. I said, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to have him on a next plane to Washington. <laughs> well, I go up to the front of the plane, get on the on the phone and say, well, you've got to get a plane down here and, and pick up this fellow and take him back to Washington. Uh, so uh, we, we drop off each of the presidents at their respective countries and our advanced people had a little ceremony in one of those countries because President Johnson liked uh, artwork from the places he visited. They decided that, to have their National Art Gallery take their prized artwork and, and display it at, this, at the airport reception inside the terminal. So we're going around with the president of that country and President Johnson's admiring the artwork. And uh, he stops at one, he says, I'll take this one. Well, the jaw of that host company, country president nearly dropped. But uh, that uh, artwork is now at the LBJ Library. <laughs> it was like the Mona Lisa of, of that particular country. Anyway, we get back to Washington and, uh, and uh, uh, go to the bedroom the next morning. And he says, where's my Chinaman? I said, it's coming, uh, probably be here tomorrow. <laughs> you know? Well, the, he, he picks him up. Uh, he's brought back this uh, Wong, at that time spoke Spanish and Chinese, no English. He is uh, taken from El Salvador to Washington, taken up to the, to the uh, guest quarters of the White House. That's his first uh, time in the United States. And, uh, and he's brought, uh, and I'm told the next day that, uh, that he's here. So I go to the bedroom and the president uh, says, uh, and we're going over stuff, and I said, well, your Mr. Wong is here. He says, great, have him brought in. <laughs> and so this little fellow who weighed 100 pounds at most, uh, is brought in and he has two interpreters. Uh, one speaks Spanish, one in, uh, translates in Spanish, one in Chinese. And uh, so President Johnson would ask him various questions and uh, he would answer and, he'd, he, and one interpreter would start uh, with the translation and the second one would finish. And uh, finally you see President Johnson, he said, now, why, why, why do you fellows, why, why didn't one of you do it? And he said, well, he starts in Spanish and he finishes in Chinese. And as President Johnson he said, tell him when you start in Spanish, you finish in Spanish. When you start in Chinese, you finish in Chinese. In any event, Mr. Wong became uh, uh, on the personal staff of President Johnson and uh, stayed with him uh, right until his death. And the good news is, as I understand it, uh, uh, Mr. Wong's entire family was reunited and they're living in the United States and uh, it, was, it was just a great experience. Um, let's see, what other things that might be of interest? There are so many that unless someone prompts something, um, uh, President Johnson's a practical joker, uh, which a lot of people didn't know. One of the things he liked to do as both a practical joke and to move people forward 
uh, in the 60s, there, it was a time of change in a certain amount of social turmoil, as you know. Uh, and President Johnson wanted to bring, particularly had such a devotion to civil rights and to, uh, to bringing about an equality among races. Well, he, uh, he would show movies in the hangar at the, at the uh, ranch, and he would invite, invite people from townspeople or friends of his who are Texans to come down, and he liked to, uh, he liked to see their reactions. He pretended to go to sleep during the movies, but he would be uh, secretly watching everybody else's reactions, and a couple of those, one was The Graduate, where it was, uh, it was racy for those days, uh, and the other one was uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which was an um, interracial marriage uh, situation. It was uh, Sidney Poitier and uh, Spencer uh, Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. Uh, and it was one of those um, cutting edge movies about uh, uh, understanding race and what have you. And uh, he, he really delighted in both bringing those movies and inviting people and seeing how they, how they reacted in their attitudes. A uh, fascinating person in, in every respect. I don't think I'll ever meet or know someone who is multifaceted, uh, who, who had a razor-sharp mind, a memory that wouldn't quit. Uh, again, going back to a, a, a White House experience, um, in, uh, we, we, were t we were had, had to send up legislation to, uh, to do something on the strategic reserve. Uh, these are the special metals, special minerals that we had in, st in a strategic stockpile. And uh, we, we wanted to have some legislative changes to that. And Joe Califano had been assigned that responsibility. And Joe was having a difficult time trying to figure out on, on a couple of these uh, uh, rare metals or rare uh, items that had been in the stockpile, uh, who knew what they were for, et cetera. And, uh, and he raised the issue, and, and um, President Johnson said, well, you know, back about 30 years ago, when I was a young congressman on the, Navy sub, on the Naval uh, Committee, uh, there was a fellow on the staff who was an expert in these things. And the last I heard, I think he was living up in Maine or Vermont. So they had the White House operators see if they can find him. Well, Joe did. They found him, and Joe said it was remarkable. He, he was surprised that Lyndon Johnson remembered him. He was the expert on those particular issues, and it said it solved the problem. So he, he had a memory like that. He also had a, an intuition and an instinct about Congress, even though he had not been in the Congress uh, for, at that time, uh, roughly eight years. He had a, uh, an intuitive understanding of the web, uh, of, of the flow of congressional activity. One of them had to do with um, uh, the appointment of, of uh, or the nomination of Abe Fortas as uh, Chief Just Justice of the Supreme Court and Homer Thornberry to take the vacancy of the Supreme Court. This was following uh, uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren's resignation. And uh, uh, President Johnson assigned you know, Cliff Alexander, myself, Barefoot Sanders, Joe Califano, his, his top team at the White House to make sure this got through the Congress. And a Republican senator from Michigan, Bob Griffin, was leading the opposition to that. And uh, here we had the, the best talent, and we really thought we knew what we were doing, uh, trying to garner votes and get an, a, an accurate uh, uh, vote count, put count. And I remember uh, we would meet periodically with the president, and he would want a progress report, and he was pushing us and, and really prodding us to do these things. Well, we had one meeting, and we were giving him the report, and we were still optimistic that we might win the vote. And he said, fellas, you lost it. He said, the tide's turned. Uh, the, the vote's over. And at that time, we hadn't recognized it, and we had been in contact and sometimes on the hill itself. And President Johnson, not having been there, understood the, the flow of, of congressional activity and when tides turn, et cetera, and he still had that, that sense, that intuitive sense about the way Congress works and, and, and whether or not you could succeed there. God, there's so many others, I can't yeah. think of them all. Well, it's great. It's be a great resource for okay. the library. Good. Okay, thank you. Great to see you.